So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ian Robertson. I'm the uh, Senior Engineering Director at, uh, at uh, Test and Embedded Analytics. Today, I'm going to talk about the uh, leveraging the RISC-V Efficient Trace uh, standard. And uh, I'm not going to keep saying RISC-V Efficient Trace all the way through this. I'm going to refer to it by uh, its commonly, uh, the common name of E-Trace. So what I'm going to cover today, uh, so first of all, uh, um, a, a little bit of background, I guess, you know, why would you use trace? Uh, um, I'm going to cover some basics, of, of, of basic principles of uh, how tracing is done in general. Uh, um, we're then going to take a closer look at the E-Trace standard. Uh, I'm going to dive a bit deeper into uh, uh, some of the efficiency options that come with that and then wrap up with some conclusions. So, okay, so first of all, so, you know, what, what why use trace at all, really? So, uh, um, you know, understanding program behavior is not always easy. Uh, the traditional way of, uh, of dealing with that maybe would be to, you know, halt the CPU, single step, and so on. But this is not always practical, particularly in real-time applications, and and less so uh, in modern SOCs where you typically have, you know, multiple uh, um, CPUs and other devices interacting with one another. So the kind of problem that you may be trying to debug or optimize. Uh, may be dependent on interactions between components and as soon as you stop halt those interactions disappear and and you know you can't you can't figure out what's going on so uh, so having access to uh, a, you know observation at full speed uh, is really important uh, um, but that could potentially you know result in a lot of uh, data that you need to extract from the chip and so being able to do that in a very efficient way uh, is important Invariably, the amount of bandwidth you've got available for getting stuff out is less than you'd like. So, uh, um, what you need for that is a, is a trace solution, and uh, you know, the, the process of trace provides that and, and allows you to do a whole load of, uh, of, of different uh, debugging, profiling, and so on. So, okay, so uh, it's a, just, a, I guess, an example of, uh, of uh, uh, how trace could be used, a practical example. So, this came from a, a paper that uh, Richard Bond from Seagate gave at the Siemens user to user. -to -user. A presentation earlier this year, uh, um, so uh, I stole this from, from, from Richard. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> um, so um, I guess, so you know, in this example, they're, they're building uh, uh, disk drive controllers, you know, modern disk drives. We're talking about, you know, uh, 2.4 nanometer positioning accuracy for the heads. And this is, uh, you know, obviously is gonna require huge amounts of, of, of real-time compute. Uh, but within uh, a fairly uh, constrained uh, power and, uh, and area cost limits. And so uh, the way that, 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 you know, what Seagate have done here is they used a RISC-V processor. Uh, they, they coupled that to a, a, a trace encoder from, from, Seagate, uh, from, from Siemens, uh, which uh, allowed them to, uh, you know, fully understand uh, exactly what was happening in their code, optimize that, there was also a cycle accurate capability in that particular encoder, uh, which uh, allows the you know, uh, tight loops to be really optimized down. And as a result, you know, for the, the, one of these key metrics, they, re, they, they achieved a, a 3x reduction in the computational cycle. So uh, a, a good example of, of, of how trace can be used in practice. So, so Okay, so, so uh, how exactly is, is, is Trace uh, um, usually implemented? So fundamentally, there, there, are, there are two key components in a Trace solution. One is, uh, is an encoder, which would be hardware on the die uh, connected to the CPU uh, that's uh, uh, monitoring the, uh, the instructions that are executed, encoding and compressing that, and then sending that uh, off, uh, typically off chip to a decoder, which is a software which will use that information along with the program binary uh, to reconstruct uh, the execution uh, path through the program. And the most common form, I guess, of this is called processor branch trace. And in this context, branch means, you know, uh, um, any uh, non-sequential change in the program. Uh, uh, it's not just branch instructions. Uh, um, and, you know, the, the, using this approach, uh, um, you can achieve a very high compression, and high compression means you can trace more. You know, either if you're tracing into a buffer, uh, then uh, um, you can you can get more instruction information in there. If, you uh, know, alternatively, you may be able to trace more cores at the same time. Um, 
And uh, eTrace is a form of processor branch trace. Uh, it also includes some additional uh, optional modes which offer even higher compression and as well as some, some debugging aids for software uh, decoder developers. Um, it also includes data trace. Uh, data trace uh, takes the address and data of uh, loads and stores and, and traces that as well. Okay, so let's, let's just, I, I guess, take a little worked example here. So, you know, trace begins by reporting the start address. Uh, so this, this provides a sync point for the decoder. Uh, uh, it can identify where in, in the code you are. And from there, you know, only branches, uh, um, uh, interrupts, and exceptions, and so on uh, uh, get reported. So, um, for example, here we can see, uh, um, you know, the, the after the start address, the next couple of instructions are sequential, so they're not reported. We have a branch, it's not taken. Next set of instructions are sequential, they're not reported. We have a taken branch, repeat some instructions, uh, and then a, finally a, a non-taken branch. And this information goes into the into the trace output, which allows the decoder to reconstruct what's happening. Okay, so let's look more now at the uh, at the eTrace uh, standard. So, you know, a successful uh, debug and trace ecosystem requires a group of people working together uh, on a common set of standards. And the uh, eTrace standard is one such standard, um, and it covers both uh, instruction and data trace as well as the interface uh, between the, uh, the CPU uh, and the encoder. And actually that interface is, uh, is uh, not specific to eTrace. It's in the eTrace standard because that's where it was devised, but uh, it's equally applicable to other trace standards as well. And uh, most of what's in the standard was originally donated by uh, Siemens or Ultrasoc as, as we then were, and then refined by the community and ratified. Um, uh, and so here we have a timeline it's just showing some of the history of that. So it starts back in 2018 uh, uh, with Ultrasoc developing the first uh, commercially available trace encoder for RISC V. Shortly after that, there was a, the a trace working group was formed. And ultimately, that resulted in the version one of the specification being ratified in 2020. So this includes instruction trace only. Uh, um, further work uh, um, resulted in version two was ratified uh, um, uh, in May of last year. And this includes uh, data trace. Um, and, uh, you know, activity is continuing as well. So in, in uh, both of these standards focused uh, uh, specifically on the, uh, uh, um, the trace packet formats. It didn't, uh, um, didn't standardize the uh, encapsulation that's needed for, for, for transport. There are uh, some illustrative examples of how to do that in here but uh, uh, they're not in a kind of normative specified format. So there's work going on with the eTrace encapsulation task group, which, which I chair, uh, to, to codify that into a standard. Okay, so uh, um, I guess, so the E in eTrace e stands for efficient. So, uh, uh, and, and you know, this illustrates, um, you know, uh, uh, I guess, uh, uh, what, why that is. We can see uh, um, you know, the, the encoding efficiency is, is very high in the order of uh, you know, a tenth of a bit uh, per instruction. And as I said earlier, you know, this, the, the efficiency means you can trace for longer or more uh, and, and, and use less bandwidth. So um, I was going to dig a little bit deeper into the eTrace standard itself and, and, and what that comprises. So, uh, firstly, you know, it contains a, a number of mandatory parts. Um, so there's the interface between the encoder and the CPU. Uh, there's the, uh, um, the uh, um, branch trace encoding algorithm and, and, the, and, the, and the packet format. And then on top of that, we have a number of um, optional uh, 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 features and enhancements. Uh, comprising a, a whole mixture of things. So we have you know, data trace, support for uh, superscalar CPUs, uh, do a multiple, uh, in, in retire multiple instructions per cycle. Uh, um, several modes aimed at improving the efficiency. Uh, a few others uh, that are aimed at uh, making it easy to debug decoders uh, uh, and then support for uh, filtering and, and, and timestamps and so on. Uh, I guess, so the, the, uh, the Siemens encoder also has an additional capability which is not currently uh, part of the standard, but I guess is a potential candidate for future work, which is around uh, cycle accurate trace. So uh, 
Because what this means is as well as being able to determine what the CPU executed, you can determine on a cycle by cycle basis exactly when uh, those instructions were executed or indeed in the case of a superscalar CPU, how many instructions per cycle were, were, were executed. So um, continuing with the efficiency theme, I'm going to look a little bit more closely at the, uh, at the options uh, available for improving the efficiency. Um, and the, the first of those is what's known in the ETRA spec as implicit return, uh, sometimes referred to as a call stack. So, uh, you know, uh, um, programs are, uh, typically contain a lot of functions. Uh, you know, when a function is, uh, is called, uh, the return address for that function is pushed onto a stack. When the function returns, that return address is popped off the stack, put into a register, and then you do an indirect jump. Uh, to that address, and so that's an indirect jump, and indirect jumps normally have to be reported uh, in full in the trace. But of course, uh, uh, well-behaved functions generally return to the instruction which is sequentially after the call, and so uh, um, uh, um, you can take advantage of that. And the way you do that is uh, in hardware, you, you push the uh, predicted return address onto a stack. When the function returns, you compare that address, beg your pardon, with the go back with the, um, you compare that with the expected return address and if they match, uh, uh, then there's, there's no need to uh, generate a trace packet including the, uh, uh, the, the, um, uh, the return address at all. And uh, this can be extended further. So if you associate a, uh, a counter with each stack entry, then you can use this to keep track of recursive functions so that they don't consume uh, any stack resources. Which, uh, and this can give a, a very significant benefit uh, for most programs. Um, the next option is the branch prediction capability. So uh, branches normally generate one bit of trace each to indicate whether the branch is taken or not. Um, but uh, you can enhance that uh, with the addition of a fairly simple uh, predictor. Uh, so if you have a branch predictor that you implement both in hardware and uh, 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 equivalently in the decoder, then um, you can essentially keep count track of the number of, uh, of correctly predicted branches and only when you have a misprediction do you need to report and you output the count of, uh, of correctly predicted branches uh, prior to the one which failed. And, and this benefits really benefits programs with lots of loops, particularly uh, uh, tight loops. Um, we then have a, a jump target cache. So if you have uh, um, you know, functions that are called repeatedly uh, um, when, when, the, um, when the function is called, if it's called with an indirect jump, you can put the address of that uh, jump into a, into a cache. If, it, uh, if the same function's called again later uh, um, and, the, and the address is in the cache, um, then instead of reporting the, the address of the target, you can report the index number of the cache entry, and it's typically fewer bits, and so uh, you, you get a more efficient encoding that way. And then finally, there's a, there's a sequential inferrable jump mode, which uh, is, uh, um, takes advantage of some of the uh, um, kind of instruction fusion that you can get with uh, RISC-V. So, you know, instruction pairs such as uh, LUIPC and JALR, which add a constant to the PC, put that in a register and then jump to it, uh, can be treated as inferrable. Because all the information here is, is in the source code, it's just uh, spread amongst two instructions rather than being in one. Um, so, um, Let's, uh, uh, I guess, the, so the next thing I want to show is some, is some uh, results. So we, we ran uh, the, the uh, uh, you don't need to digest this table, I've got some nice graphs. Uh, but basically we, we ran the, the mbench uh, benchmark suite uh, uh, against the encoder with the, with the optional uh, encoding improvement modes both turned on and off. And, you, and, uh, and from that you, you measure the, uh, the, the bits per instruction of trace that are generated. And, and, and you know, here we can see uh, some of the results. So first thing to note here is uh, um, that you know, there's a very wide range of encoding efficiencies. Uh, it's very dependent on the particular nature and characteristics of the program. Some programs are much uh, more compressible than others. Um, the second thing we can see here, so in the dark green, we've got the, the encoding efficiencies uh, uh, of, the, of the basic uh, um, mandatory features, and then in the pale green, with the optional efficiency extensions turned on. And uh, overall, uh, uh, there's an improvement uh, here of about 40% in the, in the bits per instruction. Although, you know, it, it varies uh, um, um, between, so it, it's always better, but uh, uh, sometimes not by much. You know, and then you get cases where it's a lot better, in some cases, you know, extremely 
uh, extremely be a lot better. Uh, and then we can analyze this a little bit further. So the next thing we can look at is, is you know, how is that breaks down amongst the different, uh, different optional modes. So we can see actually that you know, the biggest contributor to the improvement is the implicit return capability. Uh, and you know, on average, we see somewhere around about 36% here. Uh, actually, even with a, uh, um, a, a, a stack which has only room for one address, uh, you get well over 30%. So most of the benefit comes with, uh, um, with the simplest hardware implementation. And as you add a deeper stack, then things improve. So on, on average, around 36%, but you can see some programs like the CRC32, we see a 98% improvement in encoding efficiency with this. Um, and then similarly with a branch predictor, maybe around 6% on average, rising to nearly 40 in some cases. I think this case, uh, the predictor's only got four entries in it. It's a very, very simple predictor, two bits per entry only, uh, um, so not much hardware involved in, in, in that. And then finally with the jump target cache, again, on average, the improvement is small, a couple of percent, although you know, rising to maybe 10. And, and this, I think, is, is, is one or two uh, entries in the cache, so uh, pretty small. Okay, so I guess to summarize, uh, you know, we can say, hopefully, you know, uh, it's clear why understanding program behavior is complex and why uh, having a, a non-intrusive full speed uh, um, uh, uh, tracing coding uh, is um, uh, is required. You know, an efficient trace for risk five addresses this, and uh, the optional encoding modes are, offer a significant benefit on top of that. Um, I'm going to go further as well, of course, and in the words of uh, um, my former colleague, uh, um, who many of you know, Gajinder Panasar, he would say uh, it's not all about the CPU, it's about the system, and actually being able to observe the, the overall behavior of the whole system is, is is uh, even more challenging, but, but nonetheless necessary. Uh, and um, you know, the, the, we have a solution which uh, can help you solve that problem. Uh, so the Test Embedded Analytics platform has a, a full RISC-V standard compliant tracing coder uh, and a whole bunch of other IP that you can use for system level visibility. And, and that's the end, so thank you very much. Um, I'll happily take uh, any questions.